Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Podcast Boys. I am joined by, I am Con, the Comics Kid 2099, first of all, and I am joined by Connor Nielsen. Uh, Connor, how are we doing today? Doing very well. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well as well. We are talking about the fourth episode of Twin Peaks titled, what is the title of this one? I have the Internet Movie Database up. What, what's, what's this one called? Laura's Secret Diary. Oh, yes, that's it. And, Connor, what all happened in the episode Laura's Secret Diary? The episode opens up with uh, probably one of the best openers I've seen in a while. Uh, Ray Wise, uh, Leland Palmer, was arrested at the end of the last episode. He is being questioned by uh, Sheriff Truman and Dale Cooper uh, for the murder of Jacques Renault. And there's actually uh, Donna's dad, Dr. Hayward, also with him in the room. I don't know why, but he's there. And uh, afterwards, you know, we get a little bit of uh, dialogue about some of the stuff that's going to be happening in the next coming episodes about uh, uh, Judd is going to be in town soon. We also have Leo Johnson is going to have some kind of test sooner or later. I guess that's maybe why Donna's dad was there, but he wasn't talked to about that, so whatever. Also, at the Great Northern, uh, Benjamin Horn is doing his usual strutting around uh, with his cigar when a receptionist, a lobby, or what, lobby girl, concierge, whatever, whatever her title is, uh, comes up and says that this one dude who was like some kind of writer on Towns, I guess, I don't know if he's like a reviewer, a critic, restaurants, or what was his title again? I, I kind of just got the opinion that he was a food critic. M.T. M. Wentz was his name. Yeah, M.T. Wentz is going to be around. He's some he's like a columnist of some kind. For yeah, a, a traveling CFC. columnist, I guess, yeah. And so uh, nobody knows what he looks like. He only pays in cash. He's very discreet. He's a bit of a secret. Anyways, so uh, we're given uh, the, you know, he's going to show up in Twin Peaks today. And she was given a, a, a tip about that. And so now everyone's kind of preparing for the arrival of M.T. Wentz. Everyone's on their best behavior. As this happens, uh, Audrey Horn is being shelled up at the One-Eyed Jack still, and then Jacques Renault comes to visit Ben saying, hey, we have your daughter. Uh, they have your daughter. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'll, you know, I'm just the messenger. I'm just here to set this all up. I sell insurance to the One-Eyed Jacks. So that's our connection on to what Jacques actually does and how he's even roped into this all. And he says, I want Dale Cooper. Anyways, meanwhile, uh, Donna is having a date, a lunch date with, uh, what's that fellow's name? Uh, uh, Harry? Yeah, Harry. No, no, it's not Harry. Uh, Harold. Harold, yes. Um, the agoraphobic person that she met on the uh, Meals on Wheels route, and then he reads probably the most uncomfortable um, uh, what <laughs> blurb he possibly could have from Laura's secret diary. And he also said, at the end of last episode, we found out Laura had a secret diary and Harold had it. And this time he's like, oh, look, and I have the secret diary. Would you like to hear a little bit of it? And she's like, sure, why not? And they have a toast to Laura. Anyways, as this thing goes on, Norma and Hank are set in the double R, readying it for M.T. Wentz's arrival. And uh, we also have Ben Horn say, what up, uh, Cooper? I need your help. Uh, you're right about Audrey. She is in danger, and I need you and to, to go up and save my daughter. He's like, but hold on now. Uh, why don't you approach the proper authorities about this? And then uh, Ben somehow manipulate Cooper into going to the one jacks to possibly help him out. And then what happens is uh, Cooper then goes to Harry and says, hey, I'm on the book. Boys, this is really, really important. He says, hey, right, we'll uh, meet, meet you at uh, 9 o'clock, uh, 9.30 p.m. Sharp. Meanwhile, uh, we were threatened last episode, and they were uh, they followed up on that threat. Josie is back, uh, and then uh, we are informed that they have still not found Catherine's body. They think she is dead. They're gonna have a uh, funeral for her. Um, just that um, Pete is just not sure what they're gonna bury. And so we also have I've been I've been skirting around this uh, all episode. Pretty much the central story here is Lucy is still preggers and she's still angry about it and then she has dick jermaine come on uh dick jermaine drops on by and it's like hey here's money for an abortion she's like in the most long-winded way possible says get away i don't want to see you ever again and then she's also still kind of upset with andy because andy when i uh donna's dad dr hayward was over earlier was like hey my sperm count i want to get it up i think i can get my sperm count up here, why don't you, you know, give me a sample of this little thing? So then he goes to the bathroom, and then, you know, she and, uh, sorry, Andy and uh, uh, Lucy run into each other. Then it turns out he, you know, using a, he had some flesh wool in his hand for some inspiration. And then um, 
Officer Brennan. Uh, you know, Lucy's little, like, you know, don't, don't know if I approve of that flesh world. You know, you walk into the men's restroom with some flesh world, Officer Brennan, and Andy's like, oh, but we do get a bit of a clue. Um, as Andy is walking out with his, uh, you know, his sample, he drops it and it rolls on under the thing and then he's got some boots on and we find out that, uh, uh, Cooper finds out that Andy got these boots from, um, the traveling shoe salesman that in last episode kind of fritzed out and just kind of disappeared. We also figure out that, um, Leland Palmer's story about Robertson being next door to the summer house, there was, that house never belonged to anyone named Robertson, so God bless you, Hawk, thank you so much. Uh, for giving us that information, although it didn't really amount to anything. Um, this all, episode doesn't have any hawk, so that's a bummer. Now that we ha- and that those same shoes that Andy is wearing are the same boots that they found at Leo's house. And the giant said there'd be a clue. They thought it was the cocaine. Maybe it was the shoes. Because, if we all remember, the one I, the one armed man is in, uh, was you know, has been in uh, Cooper's dream. So this might all be connected. Um, anyways, uh, then uh, Andy, uh, sorry, Harry meets up with It'd be a different scene, but Harry meets up with Josie. They have a very uncomfortable and awkward scene, and then that uh, Asian man who's kind of been in the background is standing right outside the window. Bum, bum, bum. And then if, if later, you thought if you thought their encounter was awkward, him just staring at them while they do it that was really weird. Yeah, it was also the funniest part of the scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then what happens is winding this all down. This is a lot, kind of a lot happens. There's a lot to catch up on with this episode. This weird Asian guy, uh, I'm just going to call him Fu Man Shu shows up, and he's in cash at the, uh, the Great Northern. Uh, the receptionist from earlier is like, I think this might be Empty Wednesday. She calls uh, the double R, and she's like, hey, Empty Wednesday, I think the eagle has landed. Meanwhile, at the double R this whole time, there's been this really uh, um, large, obnoxious, uh, trucker looking guy has been there and uh, has not exactly been uh, liking the above and beyond service that Norma and uh, Hank have been providing. And it turns out that he's actually like a Hank picks his pockets because you know he's Hank um, and sees that he's actually like a department of uh, the Bureau of Investigation. He might be part of the FBI. He, I guess. He's a uh, he's the guy who determines if a prisoner will have bail. Uh, they mentioned uh, they mentioned his name at the beginning of the episode, and then when we when uh, Hank pulls up his badge, I actually paused it and Googled his name, and then it's like, oh yeah, he's the guy. I guess a, he's not a bail bondsman, is he, or is that what that is? No. So what happened was like they say that the judge is gonna appear. They also say somebody else is gonna come up you know, to, to see bail for uh, Leland, and I guess that's when he showed up. They didn't really make that clear. So no, not really. So then the judge shows up, and he's really cool. And, you know, he has a quick word with Leland uh, before sending him back away. And then, you know, they all get it. They have a hard job. And then, at the house, Cooper meets up, and he shows up. He's like, hey, I'm your guy. <laughs> then, uh, right before they can get into business, we cut to the double R, where Hank is still sleeping. Poor Hank. And then there's a knock on the door, and then, what do you know? It's that Asian guy who's been stalking everybody, and is even stalking Josie. And then they have a little bit of a tussle, and there's a bit of a creepy ending where... Uh, he puts his bloody finger on Hank's bloody finger and says, all right, blood brother. And then he says, next time I'm going to take your head off. And he crushes the flashlight. End episode. Yeah, so, Carl, was... kid, what did you think of this episode? Uh, I thought it was an okay episode. Uh, I'm not too crazy about the amount of screen time that we've got with Lucy and the pregnancy subplot. Uh, I've said many times before, I like Lucy and Andy whenever we get them in small doses and when they are not part of a main subplot of this series. And right now, they're getting a main subplot, and I feel like they had more screen time in this episode than they did in half of season one uh, together, combined. Um, I Especially, Lucy is just a horrible human being. We find out that the reason she broke up with Andy is because he doesn't own a sports coat, he didn't exercise, and he didn't, what was it, didn't clean his room or something like that. <laughs> and, like, I could, I could understand if, like, they were just not compatible, like, emotionally or something like that, if she had an actual valid reason to have broken up with him. But she's telling, because uh, Cooper comes in, and he basically is like a school principal se- sending Andy to his room and then says, all right, Lucy, we need to talk, young lady. And he asks her to explain why she's been in such a mood lately and then she says well you know and she says that she says uh that 
Uh, it didn't work out. Andy doesn't have a sports coat. Uh, he doesn't exercise. And these seem like really stupid reasons for her to break up with him. Uh, but then uh, she's like, and then I met Dick Tremaine, and he was wonderful, except that he's not. And, like, we've seen evidence of that. Dick Tremaine is just... A, he's not a very interesting character, and B, he's kind of a horrible human being here, too. I would say he's close to Lucy. I'm not sure if he's worse than Lucy or not as bad as Lucy, but both of these two are just awful. And I feel kind of bad for Andy, which is weird, because usually I don't really... Andy doesn't do it for me. Uh, but, yeah, him trying to figure out if uh, he is, in fact, capable of fathering kids, uh, you know, that seemed like a very intelligent thing for him to do, which is, uh, I'll give him credit for that, since this is Andy we're talking about. But, yeah, I wasn't crazy about Lucy in this episode. Um, the empty went subplot. Uh, <sighs> you know, I've said many times in this season that, like, they're trying to find ways to keep this series going once they wrap up the Laura Palmer subplot. And I wouldn't mind that if they had some substantive actual subplots that would be interesting to follow. Uh, a few episodes ago, Al told Cooper that Wyndham Earl escaped, uh, and that is going to be a uh, pretty big subplot in this world. It would be great if we could have multiple subplots like that, uh, things that are actually interesting, some actual conflict uh, that is going to be happening with these characters that exists outside of Laura Palmer. And I wouldn't mind if they continued bringing new information in from the Laura Palmer storyline, even after they solved the Laura Palmer murder. I wouldn't mind if they said, oh, here's some new information that we found from her secret diary, and it's going to lead us to a new story uh, that's going to happen down the road or something like that. But this Empty Wentz thing, it's pointless. It's just a silly subplot that shouldn't take up as much time and space in this episode as it does. I feel like I'm talking too much. What did you think of this episode, Connor? Oh, no, I felt like I went way too long on that uh, synopsis. But you kind of hit the nail on the head for me. It's just okay. I love the first scene of this, uh, of this episode. When I was watching that, I was like, Connor is going to love that. That looks like very typical David Lynch, like weird, bizarre camera angles and like panning out and it's the cork board. Uh, like I was thinking Connor is going to get a kick out of that. Well, I mean, I love it. Like it starts off here. Like, are we in a hole? Are we in like an ear? Like yeah. where are we? Like this is kind of neat. And then like it kind of pans out like, okay, is this the desert? Why are we in the desert? And then it keeps going out and you see like three little uh, holes. I'm like, oh, this is Dr. Jacoby's coconut. Wait, no, it's not. This is a, there's a lot of holes. Oh, is this like, you know, when those like uh, uh, ceiling tiles you see in like elementary schools? And then it kind of is because it's an entire wall of them. Right. Uh, and then uh, we see just uh, Leland's face is in shock and the sound, like it really captured what it must have felt like to be in his head at that moment. Um, and I loved it. And then the Leland's monologue, just just a great demonstration of uh, Ray Wise's talent. It's just the right over-the-top soap, uh, but also with that music, you know, the piano music that we hear a million times playing, it really got to me. And, like, I started getting chills. I kind of started to, like, really feel emotionally for Leland. And for something as morally reprehensible as murder, man, I, I was like, man, poor Leland. Poor yeah. Leland. And they kind of touch on that uh, later in the episode when Dr. Hayward... Uh, is saying that he feels sorry for Leland, and then Cooper kind of uh, gives him a stern look and says, are you saying you support what he did? And Hayward's like, well, no. And and there's kind of a little bit of tension there, which I thought was good. Um, it doesn't, that scene, I don't know if you remember the one I'm talking about, that yeah. scene that scene doesn't end with uh, Cooper with a smile on his face saying, I understand, Doc, and like patting him on the shoulder. He just kind of walks off angry. Um, I, I, I want to say, though, uh, right afterwards, like the whole thing, kind of gets back into typical season two territory that I've been feeling so far. Mm -hmm. I went back and listened to some of our podcasts on episode one. Uh, sorry, season one. Season one was a lot of fun. Yeah. This, like, you can really feel the growing pains. And, I mean, the whole empty went up, you hit it right on the head. Like, this this show is trying to find something to occupy its character's time. That's, that's all this is. And, I mean, you know, oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just, well, we have got to get, like, we haven't seen Hank in a couple episodes. We haven't seen Norma in a couple episodes. What do we do? Uh, rope them into this thing. Uh, and let's just have this overacting uh, receptionist concierge lady. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, that girl actually having lines and having a part 
in this episode. It kind of reminded me of the season one finale when that lawyer was talking to Catherine about the will, uh, or not the will, but uh, the, yeah. uh, the the sawmill and how uh, she had a life insurance policy, but she didn't know about it. And lo and behold, we haven't seen that lawyer guy since then. I'm pretty sure he's not going to show back up in this series. Uh, this girl, like, actually having dialogue is weird because usually if a character has, like, actual screen time and is doing things, is actually somewhat advancing the plot, even if it's a silly subplot, then that means usually that they're going to be a main character in the show. And I don't think this girl's going to show up again in a series. And I actually, uh, I wanted to look her up, but I don't know if she even had a name given, so I'm not sure if I would be able to find her in this uh internet movie database listing but yeah, yeah that was a little odd that she had so and it's not even that she had so much to do really all she does is she talks to ben horn and tells him that mt wince is coming then later in the episode she talks to somebody who she thinks is mt wince who we are going to call fu manchu uh, and then she calls norma and says hey mt wince is coming and that's it like it, it was just like let's take this uh very very minor character who's not even gonna have a name i'm a founder her name on internet movie database is desk clerk uh, yes. So, you know, let's take her and give her some dialogue. And I'm looking, and it looks like she's been in stuff. Uh, like just recently, she was been in. She's been in a few things, but not like a whole lot of major stuff. She was in Sons of Anarchy. Uh, she was in ER, uh, but not a whole lot of like really major roles. Yeah, she, to me, she was like a little too scenery chewing, a little too, a little too much. A little uh, bit, yeah. I do want to say something. There's stuff that this episode does very well. I really like the scene between Jacques and Ben. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's great seeing Ben in this powerless position because he's been the bad guy. He's always been the, Mwahaha, I hold all the power. He's always moving his hands and holding that cigar. And uh, this really, like, okay, the thing with this whole uh, Jacques, uh, this uh, Jean Renault, uh, this whole subplot, I'm really digging it because this feels like a natural progression of season one and less like, Oh man, what do we have Donna do? Uh, there's this guy named Harold, and he has a secret diary. We never heard about it before, but now there's a secret diary. Yeah. Um, and or, uh, hey, MT Wentz, don't you know who he is? He's gonna be in Twin Peaks later. That'll that'll throw us a bone for an episode or two. This this feels like a natural progression, and this feels like a character that would have fit right at home in season one. Mm -hmm. And I like him. It's like it's escalation. It's a bigger dog on the block. And watching Ben Horn lose his composure just by throwing a chair, it was satisfying to see that. And uh, I like this plan that they have where, like, uh, Jean is kind of, like, he's playing the messenger, but he's definitely the ringleader. And I like that scene he has between Audrey where he's playing her like he's playing her dad. Um, and then we get to see him shoot that one annoying guy, which is a blast. And, yes, yes, that was great. Um, the, uh, the only thing I don't understand is why he thinks Agent Cooper shot his brother. Because uh, Leo, Leo killed Bernie, and then Leland killed Jock. Yeah, right? um, that's a that's a good point. I guess maybe he somehow knows that that guy. Well, no. See, I was gonna say he somehow knows that that guy wasn't supposed to be there at One Eye Jacks, and you know he's there that night, and then that's the night that Jock gets arrested and killed. Um, so maybe he drew a line there saying, okay, this guy who I've never seen before at One Eye Jacks. He somehow had something to do with my brother's disappearance, but he shouldn't know that because he only found out in this episode that Cooper is a federal agent. Uh, ben had to tell him that when he said, I want this man in this videotape right here. And Cooper sa uh, Ben said, well, that's a federal agent. And then he's like, well, you know, make it happen. So, like, there's really – you raise a good point. Like, Cooper didn't actually have any direct involvement with Jacques' death. He only lured Jacques back to Twin Peaks where he was arrested by the police and then he was killed by someone else but maybe it does feel like you know there was a step missing there like they they had this guy uh when they first introduced him he was just kind of the mysterious oh who is he oh he's Jacques Renault's brother and he's working with these other bad guys and then when we find out that he wants revenge on Cooper I, I didn't even think of that until you just mentioned it I just kind of took it and ran with it okay he wants revenge on Cooper and you know that's just a thing that's going to happen but that's a good point he really doesn't have any reason to suspect Cooper. Yeah, and I, I, I like his plan. I like what he's doing. I just wish there was a more concrete motivation. That Yeah, very fair. Um, I Yeah, I really like Jean. He's so cool. And what I really like is how you can logically see how he's involved in one eye jacks. His ISO insurance one eye jacks. Maybe that's why he was able to get uh, Jacques a 
um, job there. It's like, hey, you know, use me as a reference. I sell insurance. Yeah, that's a very... I, I didn't even... Uh, from the previous uh, times that I've watched this season, I did not remember that he actually had a legitimate job. I just kind of thought of him as being a bad guy and didn't really think of him as, you know, he has a job. Now, we never actually get to see him do that. Uh, of course, that would be boring, just watching him sell insurance. But, uh, yeah, it does give a good reason why he's involved with One-Eyed Jacks and also why he's previously been involved with Blackie and um, these other people with One-Eyed Jacks. Like, he just kind of waltzed in a few episodes ago, and it's like, hey, I'm back, and everyone's like, oh, it's Jean Reno. And I think maybe we were wondering, why is this guy working with him? Like, how does he know him, them? Well, now we know. Yeah, I half like the scene between Donna and Maddie. I think everything Donna says is stupid. Uh, <laughs> well, it is Donna. Yeah, and she's all of a sudden smoking again and trying to be tough chick. But Maddie basically was evoking everything I was feeling. She has a look on her face like, you're so stupid. Why Why do you think that way? What are you doing? Like, what? She has this perplexed look on her face, and that was the exact same expression I had on my face while she was talking. So I, I really like Maddie. I think she's a neat character, and I, I like the way she responds to things like a normal person would talking to these crazy people. I like, like Maddie, too. I've, I've liked her since she was introduced. I like that she is very much different from Laura Palmer because when you first start watching a show and you've got this actress, is it Cheryl Flynn who plays Maddie, or is uh, it Sherilyn Lee? Uh, Cheryl Lee. Cheryl Lee, okay. Uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to keep mixing up her and Audrey till you know, the end of times. Um, yeah, Cheryl and Fenn and Cheryl Lee. I mean, that's, how does that work? Um, so this actress, when we first start watching, and she's playing a dead character, kind of like, you know, the comedian from The Watchmen. I've, I've said that before. And I'm guessing these people, they fell in love with her as an actress. They're like, hang on a second. She's actually a good actress, and... We've already got her playing someone who's already dead, so we need to bring in a new character for her to play. And I'm glad that they did, uh, because she's really good. She's good at playing the bad girl, Laura. She's also, what little we've seen of her, it's easy to buy that everyone in the town kind of sort of bought her as the good girl also. And then Maddie's here, and she's actually a good girl. She's not just pretending to be a good girl. And it's little things that kind of clue us in with that. Like, yeah, she's moving in on another woman's boy. Uh, maybe she shouldn't have done that, but... You know, I, I kind of like Maddie anyway, like you. Um, I, I, I don't dislike her like I do James and Donna. Well, it's like she doesn't really have any ulterior motives with James. She just was trying to be friendly, and, you know, he's kind of taking advantage of her. That's true. That, uh, so. I do think she she probably could have put a stop to it. Yeah. But, but, hey, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to complain because you know why? Her actions have driven James out of town! Yeah! Uh, Is yeah. he gone now? Is he officially gone? Well, he wasn't here in this episode. Uh, I don't yeah. I don't know where he is. Um, maybe he's just hanging out with his mom, getting wasted with her. I don't know. Um, his, air quotes, mom, who you, you suggested that she doesn't actually exist, and he uses that to get with women. And I think that's a, I think that's a very good point. I will say I think it's funny that this episode, we don't have nearly as much Donna as we did in the last episode. Uh, we don't have any James at all. And this is the episode that brings us back with Josie. Um, so it seems like for the rest of this series, one of us is destined to suffer. Either you with Josie or me with Donna and James. Um, of course, neither one of us, like, I don't especially like Josie either. And I don't think you like Donna and James. But it seems like those are our foils in this show. Yeah, and can we touch on... Uh, Josie, oh my god, oh lord. So, the scene where she's talking with Pete, it's not bad because Jack Nance is so darn lovable. Everyone likes uh, Jack Nance, right? And Pete, I, 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 he's, he's given a heartfelt performance, but his, his simpleness is just so darn uh, adorable that I was kind of giggling. I'm like, there's the part where, like, at the end he goes, like, not sure what we're going to bury, though. Like, I actually laughed at that. But that scene with Harry, though, I mean, poor, what's his name, uh, Michael Antkin, I feel bad for him. Like, he, they have no chemistry. No. They have no chemistry. The scene, like, could have potentially worked if Joan Chen had been fired and they brought in an actress who was good at being seductive and, like, uh, could be versatile and being innocent but also have this dark side to her and have this kind of uh, secrecy and, like, mystique about her. Kind of like the actress they have playing Laura and Maddie. Yeah, exactly. But Joan Chen delivers every line exactly the same. And, well, English is her second language is not a good enough excuse for this kind of a thing. Especially, it's especially when 
maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I've gotten the impression that she's faking her ignorance of the English language. Like yeah. when she when she's with uh, this uh, Asian guy uh, who attacked Hank, when she's with him and when she's with Ben uh, and they're doing their evil plotting, she's not acting like what are shenanigans? Can you please explain this word to me? Like she, you know, she's acting normal. Like she she understands the English language and. I, I feel like that's just a front that she's putting up to make people not suspect that she's actually plotting stuff. And yeah. so I, I don't even think that her not knowing English uh, very well would work as an excuse anyway. Yeah. And wouldn't it have been just amazing if uh, since uh, Josie's been gone for the first couple of episodes that she just showed up and they just recast her? Yeah, like she got, uh, you know that thing they do in soap operas where like a character will come back, but they have they got a plastic surgery, and then nobody will say, or or they got plastic surgery, but hardly anyone will comment that they look entirely different or something like that. Um, it, it, it would work. She was uh, shopping. Maybe she was just shopping for a face look. You never yeah. know. She comes back. It's like Harry. What do you think? I look different. And then Harry just says, Josie, did you kill Catherine? I <laughs> just jump straight into that. <laughs> Um, and, and then that scene where it's like she's all like rip it it's like oh my god i couldn't stop cringing i was like cr- yes i my my, my 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 muscles natural reaction was just to like curl up in the fetal position <laughs> oh it was so awkward my actual reaction to that when i was watching it and she starts saying oh i need you now i want you now rip it rip it my actual words were, "Oh my goodness!" Like I was just that was nothing else had to be said. And then uh, whenever uh, it sl- slowly starts zooming into the window, and I was like, "Oh, somebody's gonna be watching someone." And then it's that guy. And like you said, it is the funniest part of that scene. Uh, it's creepy, but it is funny because his facial expression is like furious, like he's so angry, but he's not gonna like knock on the window and say, "Excuse me, young lady. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, stop that." Like he's not gonna do that. He's just gonna watch. And it was weird. Uh, it reminds me of this uh, Far Side cartoon by uh, Gary Larson. Far Side. Uh, the the one with uh, the that fear that somewhere somehow you are being watched by a duck. Um, I, yeah. It, it kind of reminded me of that. Uh, I don't know why, but that was uh, really weird and creepy. Uh, but yeah, Harry, uh, you're right. Michael Ankeen. I do kind of feel sorry for him, but on the same token. I feel like Harry is just an idiot because this is now the second time where he has straight up as bluntly as he possibly can. He has confronted Josie with a question and she kind of dodges it in a way that is in no way convincing. And somehow he buys it anyway. If you recall in season one, he asked her, hey, why were you at the hotel spying on Josie and Ben? Or no, no. Why were you at the hotel spying on Catherine and Ben? And she says, oh, I wasn't. Uh, Hawk saw you. Oh, well, I was. I was spying on them. And then, like, she doesn't answer the question. And it's just like, okay, he, you know, he asks her this question. She doesn't answer it. And then he's like, oh, well, okay, good enough for me. And then oh. basically well, the same thing happens here. Do like, what? Like, well, she was wearing a night dress. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the same thing happens here. He says, you know, did you have anything to do with it? And she basically says, well, how could you think that? He's like, you're right. You're right. Let's just go ahead and <laughs> do it right now. It. Uh, I like I don't like her, but at the same time I don't like him because he is not a smart person. I I would love to see uh, a prequel that shows how he became sheriff because surely he was running unopposed. Like there's no other way that this could have happened. Like he's not a smart well, character. Well, I want to play devil's advocate. Okay, yeah. I think Michael Ondekin is playing this guy who really wants. Uh, to get the information, but he has feelings for this woman who's toxic and he knows it, but he likes it anyway. And she seduces him and molds him into this person he doesn't want to be. Like that's what I think he's trying to do, and I can see it through his performance. The problem is he's playing off of a plank of wood, and he's <laughs> like he he can't have chemistry with her, and she's not playing it the way that would complement his character. True. So her performance is single-handedly dismantling one of the main characters. And that's what makes me hate her performance even more. Yeah, um, it's that's a good point, because I do think a lot of the weak acting in this scene is from her and not so much from him. It's just weird that the the, the scene is just structured weird. Uh, part yeah. of it is the bad acting, and part of it, I feel like, is just weird scripting. Like, I don't think that even a great actress could have saved the script where he says, hey, did you have anything to do with her death? 
Uh, hey, how, how about we have sex here on the couch? Oh, okay. Like, well, I mean, if you look, if you look at that scene though, she's like, um, oh no, no, I I heard about what happened. It's, <laughs> it's so terrible, and she like starts sitting on him and like hugging him and like trying to like manipulate him a little bit, like. And that kind of a pressure and like a kind of a steamy sort of thing, it could have worked if the performance was better. But as it is, Harry looks like a moron. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, and and we'll have plenty of other opportunities to uh, to make uh, light of this whole situation and uh, make jests at uh, this character. Um, I did want to say I feel like Harry. If we had gotten to see him in his youth, he would have been a lot like uh, James Hurley. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, th I think James Hurley, if he shows up in the uh, in the revival series, he may just be the new sheriff. <laughs> Which I would I would really hate, but at the same time, boy, it'll be interesting to talk about. Speaking of uh, characters I don't like, yeah, you were mentioning that you liked Maddie and you dislike Laura or not Laura Donna. I agree, uh, Donna is terrible as always. Uh, although I will say that I can see why she's upset. Like she's not just angry at nothing. You know, in the previous episode, she walks in the restaurant, and James and Maddie are kind of holding hands, sort of, uh, but they weren't actually doing anything. She was just comforting him because he he was kind of having relationship troubles. He's asking her, hey, is my girlfriend acting weird? Uh, can you give me some help here? Uh, I need to figure out how to deal with my weird girlfriend. And then Donna walks in and says, well, I'm with this weirdo who lives on the other end of town. His name is Harold, and he's amazing and beautiful and sweet and caring. Nothing like my current boyfriend. Like, she was overreacting then. Here, I think she's reacting at just the right level. Uh, I still don't like her, but at least she has a reason to be upset. I, well, I, I was going to say something else about these characters. Um, well, I am glad we don't have James here. Uh, we'll probably get him very soon, but uh, it's a nice little break from him. Uh, Harold. Harold is weird and creepy. I said this last week. I'm going to say it every week. Harold is weird and creepy. Uh, <laughs> like you said, they're, okay, so they're eating, all right? They're, they're eating dinner because she brought dinner, and uh, then he's like, Laura's diary. I'm going to read you a snippet from Laura's diary. Donna sometimes makes fun of me when I reveal the darkness in my soul. And, oh, I, like you said uh, about the scene between uh, Harry and Josie, it's just like, it's my only reaction was to cringe. Like, I really wanted to skip that scene, but I was like, I can't, because I'm going to have to talk about it tonight when we do the podcast. Like, he, he is so strange and weird. Like, uh, we were talking about how a little bizarre the relationship between Audrey and uh, Cooper is because he's so much older than her. But at least there's chemistry there. At least there's platonic chemistry, at least. And, you know, on Audrey's end, there's romantic chemistry. On Cooper's end, there's platonic chemistry. There's nothing here. There's just creepy and annoying. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to say. Like, this guy is messed up. Like, he's got this secret diary, and she says, oh, well, maybe we should... And she's clearly messed up about it, too. Like, she's creeped out when he's reading this, and he says, oh, what's wrong? And then she's like, well, maybe, maybe we should give it to the police. No. Why not? Well, Laura gave it to me. Okay, and you can give it to the police. Like, oh, man. And then he says, this was, this was terrible. He says, uh, I've read it cover to cover. There's nothing in there that there's no solutions here. Well, what if there's something that they can cross-reference with the diary that they have? Because he only had one diary, and the police have the other one. Maybe you should give it to the police. Like, Oh man, this character! Like, as soon as he was introduced last week, I was just like, "Oh no, I don't, I don't want to deal with this right now." Uh, and I'm really glad that he's not taking up like a large part of the episode. If he had been in it a whole lot more, I would have been really, really tempted to just skip every scene he was in. Uh, do, you, do you got anything on him? No, that was beautiful. Um, <laughs> and I, that's I, amazing. Um, and I feel bad because. It's possible that that guy is a good actor, but if I ever saw him in anything else, like if he, if I today, if I saw him in a trailer for some other movie, I would probably just be like, no, I don't want to watch that. Uh, that's that weird, creepy guy from Twin Peaks. Uh, well, here's the thing about Harold Smith. I like, I think the actor's giving it something. He's giving the twitchiness. He's giving like the like the deer in the headlights look, and like there's maybe something like uh, that could possibly be appealing beneath the weird. But he's given this material. That is just weird. Um, yeah. It's like starts reading Laura's fantasies. It's like so you read it cover to cover and you chose that to be the thing you read. Like I get that it's he's supposed to be agoraphobic and that 
he has a bit of a social disconnect. I get that. But he says that, you know, oh, people talk to me all the time. I place their stories in a living novel. Like, I'm sorry, what's a living novel? Yeah. What, uh, what do you mean? Okay, you have the information. Do you have other people's information? You know, if you don't have theirs and they just tell you these stories, then you're just relying on their word. Well, now that you kind of, you've memorized those stories. Now you have her <laughs> diary. You can pretty much get the gist of everything that she said and so memorize it and then place it in your head in that living that novel or whatever the hell you called it. Like, I don't get his logic when it comes to just being obsessive and possessive of this diary. Yeah, it's, uh, and you know what's sad is that, like, I guess somebody somewhere said, okay, we want to have this younger guy who is part of the Meals on Wheels program. Well, why do we have somebody who's not 95 years old who's in the Meals on Wheels program? Well, he's agoraphobic. He's afraid to leave the house. Okay, that means that he's weird and creepy in every aspect of his life, but he doesn't have to be. You know, just because he's afraid to leave the house doesn't mean that he's just this complete weirdo that, like, you see him and you're like, I need to go away. Like, I need to leave. You're, you're creeping me out. He doesn't have to be. He could be in the confines of his house. He could be, like, a very normal guy who just happens to be afraid to leave the house. Um, and I feel like they thought, well, someone who's like that, who is afraid to leave his house, we've got to make him just really strange and unusual. And I feel like that was a misstep. Um, I don't really see any reason to have made him this really weird dude, except maybe, like, he has the diary, and if he was a normal, well-adjusted citizen of society, he would have turned in the diary already, so they need a reason for him to have kept on to it. But that's still, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is pushing it. And probably the creepiest thing he says, though, he's like, oh, people tell me this story. My reaction was, well, who are you talking to? And then yeah. she, even Donna says, who tells you? She goes, he was Oh, you know, friends. And then he gives her the creepiest look ever. He goes, lovers. Exactly. I was, I was going to say, he mentions friends and lovers. He says, maybe you'll tell me your story someday. And I was like, run away, Donna, <laughs> run away. Like, go find James. He's much better for you than this guy. And I hate James. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. This... Last time we saw James, he freaked out. And that was hilarious. Uh, yeah, this is, uh... oh, boy. Harold Smith. Yeah. And I was looking him up. Uh, he was actually in a TV show from the 90s called The Pretender, which I used to watch when I was a youngin. Uh, I don't remember him from that show, but he played a character in about five episodes. So uh, I would have to, I actually think I have that show on DVD. So I'll have to go back and look and see if he was uh, looked any different or if I remember him from that show, because right off the top of my head, I don't remember him. You mentioned earlier that uh, you liked the scene with Ben, and I, want to, I wanted to agree. Uh, I think this is maybe Ben's best episode in the series. Uh, just up until now, we've seen that he has a very rocky relationship with Audrey. Uh, at one point, he even said he lost his daughter a long time ago. And then when she's missing for two days, he tells the police and says, yeah, she's missing, but uh, don't worry about it. Uh, she'll come home eventually. And now we get to see that he's not as cool and collected as he was trying to let on. He is uh, worried about her, even though... He still doesn't have a great relationship with her, but he's willing to do some stuff, whatever it takes, to try and get her back. And I like that. I like, like you said, I like seeing Ben not be in control of the situation. Uh, it's a good angle for his character, kind of like Audrey, because uh, yeah. up and you know throughout season one, she was a character who was kind of getting stuff done, and she was always getting whatever she wanted. I think she even had a line when she was working for that dude who got shot in this episode. She said, uh, "My name is Audrey Horn, and I get what I want," or something like that. And um, I think that it's really interesting to see the Horns not in control of the situation, and how do they handle that? Are they going to find a way to make the situation work for them, or are they just going to ask people for help? You know, in this case, Ben Horn, he asks Cooper for help uh, in handling this situation. Is he going to betray Cooper, or is he hoping that Cooper can actually bring his daughter back? Who knows? And I think it's good timing and a good parallel to have. Um, I wouldn't have really drawn, like, I didn't even draw the parallel in my head of, Audrey's kind of getting to the bottom of this Laura Palmer investigation. Ben's kind of getting to the bottom of, you know, this big plan he's been having. And now they're both hung up. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a neat parallel, kind of a cool father-daughter, how they have similar uh, – they have, they have opposing philosophies, but they're still family. They have similar ways of getting things done. Yeah. So, uh, And I, I really like this parallel, and I like Ben turning to um, – what's his name? 
uh, to Cooper. I mean, I know he was manipulated too, but it was still a good scene to have them interact with one another. Um, you know, longer than just a passing conversation in a hallway. Um, what did you think of the judge character that we meet here? I like how he gives a almost Asgardian monologue and then the thunder rings as if Thor is agreeing with him. Yeah, and he does mention uh, Valhalla. He says, we will meet her again, uh, telling Leland, you will see your daughter again in Valhalla. Um, that was, uh, he's a character who fits right in with Twin Peaks, and I wish that we had more of this, more of characters who he feels right at home in this show, and less stuff like Empty Wentz. Um, like, more characters, like, I, I almost wish that this show had stuff for him to do throughout season one and the rest of this season. Uh, but I get the feeling, and what I recall of this uh, season from when I watched it a couple of years ago is that uh, he's just going to be here for a few episodes and then he'll uh, hightail it out of town. I wish that we had actual subplots for this guy to be a part of um, somehow. I agree. And I like how they set him up. Oh, he's a traveling judge who rides a Winnebago. Yeah. Like, that's awesome. I want to see, like, a road trip show about him. <laughs> you know, yeah. going around uh, Washington just looking for small towns to be a judge in. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I also, uh, you know, a good, I, I mentioned a few episodes ago that we kept uh, complaining that uh, Pete is not uh, more involved with the plots of this series, and uh, I wish this guy was, and another good way that we could uh, bring this guy into the plots, uh, I mentioned this as a potential fix for Pete, would be to make this guy a bookhouse boy, uh, say that he's like maybe uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, like if uh, Harry is like in charge of the Bookhouse Boys just in Twin Peaks, maybe this guy is kind of like Harry's mentor, or he like runs another branch that l operates outside of Twin Peaks. Uh, that yeah, might maybe, maybe even he's like a founding member of the Bookhouse Boys. Yeah, Board. something like that. And maybe that would remove some of the the uniqueness about this town. Uh, but maybe you could just say, well, he is one of the founding members, and the Bookhouse Boys are just located in this town but he's not a full-time member anymore. Something like that would be a good way to bring this guy more heavily into the plots. Maybe he would, you know, they could say, oh, he went off to start uh, Bookhouse Boys Incorporated. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a uh, his very own Harry Truman in Japan and Africa and, uh, yeah. and an Agent Cooper in all those places. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, I don't think I had anything else to say. Did you have any other thoughts on this episode? Uh, I did. Uh, I um, I like Cooper in this episode. I always like Cooper. I really like Cooper in this episode. He seems just about as frustrated by all the stuff happening at the police department as I am. <laughs> he has to like basically play teacher for uh, Lucy and Andy. And I actually like that scene between Lucy and Cooper. I mean, it just revealed that Lucy's a materialistic, horrible person. Oh, yeah. But I like that scene. Like, uh, you know, I think Kyle McCarthy just has naturally good chemistry with everybody. He has that everyman quality about him. And I like him kind of losing his optimistic, you know, face. And he was becoming more and more cynical in this episode. And, you know, we kind of thought at the beginning, he's like, hey, are you condoning murder? And he just walks off. And I, I really, I really like Cooper in this episode. And um, he's, you know, he's still, you know, smiling and trying to do it. But I feel, I have a feeling like he's losing patience. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah, I really like that. And, you know, at one point, the judge says, what do you think of Twin Peaks? And he says, heaven, sir. Well, uh, in the span of a uh, very short time, uh, we've had arson, attempted murder of a federal agent, and uh, something else. Uh, I guess just regular murder of a French-Canadian dude. Um, like, he mentions all these crimes, and uh, he says, that's, that's what's happened in heaven. That's heaven for you. And then Cooper, he says, well, it's been pretty busy in heaven. But I think deep down, he's probably thinking to himself, yeah, this place isn't uh, the nice, cozy little backwoods town that I thought it was when I first got here. There's a lot of messed up stuff going on here, and I think it's starting to get to him. Yeah, I like his, his response is, uh, well, heaven is a very big and strange place. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and maybe he's also, you could argue that it's been getting to him for a while because uh, he kind of broke protocol whenever he went outside of his jurisdiction uh, at the end of season one uh, to go to... Uh, what do you call it, One-Eyed Jack. So uh, it's possible that he's picking up on that, that uh, this town is weird and messed up and it's not as nice and good as he thought it was when he first got here, and now it's starting to rub off on him, and maybe he's kind of uh, upset about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, other stuff I want to talk about, like, I don't want to get in length about this, but I like seeing Norma, I like seeing Ed, I, I, yeah, not Ed, but uh, 
I like seeing Hank. I like how they mention Ed. I mean, I like seeing these people. I wish they just had, you know, something better to do. Yeah. And it is a crime that there is no Hawk in this episode. Or very, very little. No, he's not in this at all. Oh, he's not in it at all? They have a passing mention that, oh, yeah, the thing Hawk said at, at last episode, well, that came through. Oh, you're right. Okay, I was thinking he actually, because I remember that, and I was thinking he was actually talking to them, but that was in the previous episode where he was mentioning that. Uh, he did, we got to see his shoulder, uh, because at one point he bumps into Andy, and Andy, he says, watch where you're going, Andy. Uh, I actually thought that was going to be your God bless you Hawk moment. Uh, I didn't even notice that part. I feel horrible. Well, it might have been it might have been one of the other cops, but I was assuming it was Hawk because uh, he uh, he's you know one of the only other cops that we actually have a name for. I was gonna say uh, something about oh man, what, uh, yes, Hank. Uh, I like I, I have said before that Hank is a very likable guy. He's probably the most likable criminal in this show, uh, and this is a great example of we see absolutely none of his illegal criminal activity in this episode. And he's just being a nice guy. Uh, he's trying to help Norma uh, get the a good review for the restaurant. Uh, he has no ulterior motives other than, well, presumably trying to get back into her life. Uh, but he's not, oh, by the way, on the side, I'm going to go over here and murder a guy for some cash. Like, he's just going and getting candles and tablecloths for the restaurant. Uh, I, I like seeing this side of Hank. Uh, it makes me like him as a character, even though I know that he's up to some really shady stuff. Um yeah, and I and I did like that scene where he said uh, to Norma, he said, "Hey, you should call Ed." And she's like, "Wait, what? Why?" Oh, uh, you know, uh, he works at a gas station. He could send some people over here. And like, I'm thinking that is a good idea, but at the same time, I think he may just be trolling her because we yeah. saw we saw a few episodes ago where uh, he said to. Uh, Shelly, he said something like, uh, yeah, Norma uh, is real good buddies with Pete, isn't she? And Shelly's like, Pete? Oh, no, I think you mean Ed. She's really good buddies with Ed. And then he's over here like, yes, Ed indeed. And like, I'm assuming that he still has suspicions about those two. So I wasn't sure if he was just kind of like toying with her or if he was actually saying, hey, have Ed send some people over here. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Just kind of trying to keep tabs on Ed to make sure he's not moving in. And I, I do think, I do want to see, at least not now, but soon, I want to see Ed and Norma talk. Because with um, Nadine, you know, in this condition that she's in, we didn't, we don't get any follow-up on that with this episode, but I want to see them talk and, like, how, you know, maybe Ed has to talk and say, hey, I, you know, we're off right now because I have to deal with this. I have to, I have to stay loyal. And, like, I, that would, you know, say a lot about, say a lot about Ed. Maybe Ed would be reevaluating his relationship with Nadine and... You know, me thinking that, yeah, you know, Norma, I love you, but we had our, we had our time, and now that time's over. Like, I would like to see something like that. I think that would um, be be welcome and, you know, move this show into a different, like, move that phase, that, that section of the show in a new direction. Yeah, and, you know, I think they kind of sort of had a moment in season one where they both kind of said, we can't keep doing this because neither one of them was willing to break it off with their spouses. But you're right, I would like to see, like, another scene where Ed basically says, I have to spend more time with my wife. I basically, she just became, like, someone I have to become a legal guardian over because now she has the mindset of a 17-year-old, and now I have to, like, watch over her in addition to, you know, running a gas station or whatever. It would be nice if we could have more of that. And I was, I have to say, I'm not especially disappointed that we didn't get any more Nadine uh, because, like I said last week, I'm not really thrilled with the subplot of her becoming a high schooler again. But, you know, we'll get more of that next episode. Uh, the downside is we aren't getting any Ed. Uh, when we don't get Nadine, we won't get any Ed. Like, it's very difficult right now with the way she's been re regressed back to being a teenager uh, you can't very easily do an Ed subplot without also bringing Nadine along. So if you're going to put Nadine on the shelf for an episode, you've also got to put Ed on the shelf. And I like Ed. Speaking of characters on the shelf, we need more Bobby. I miss Bobby. Yeah, I was no I was realizing that while we were talking. I was like, okay, we don't have any Ed. We don't have any Leo. Uh, we don't have any Shelly. We don't have any Bobby and or Nadine. And I was like, that's a lot of characters that we don't have. But at the same time, they brought in uh, the brand new Judge, and then they bring in uh, Jean Reno is in this episode. And of course, he's a pretty new character. So we've got a lot. And there's a new subplot with Empty Wentz. So we've got a lot of new stuff going on here. So they wouldn't be able to put all of the old characters or, or even most of the old characters in this episode. Like Pete is only here for about uh, a minute and a half. Uh, so, like, a lot of characters who are usually main characters, they don't have a lot to do here because this episode is having to balance a whole lot of stuff. 
I agree. I'll talk about the cliffhanger. Um, I, I kind of like it. it. I was getting a little frustrated of this Asian man just stalking people. It felt like a, it felt like a, a shaggy dog joke. Like, oh, there he is again! Oh, there he is again! Oh. Uh, I, it is a crime that he didn't end up uh, being an agent or a representative of the... Uh, Ameri- is it the American House Association? The what organization is that? I should know this by now because I made a joke about it last week. Where uh, uh, he he goes up to someone's door with a giant check and says, "Hey, you just." Uh, I still think that would have been fantastic if he had been working for them. Yeah, I agree. Um, he uh, I I have an issue with him just knocking the crap out of Hank. It's like we read comics, we we relate to comics, but. I feel like one of those things where it's like, oh, we need to, we need to, the audience to take this character seriously. They're gonna go to the biggest, toughest guy and beat him up. Take him seriously. It's like you know when you read the Justice League and all of a sudden this this bad guy, he, this bad guy can beat up all of the Justice League. Um, that's what this kind of felt like to me. Where Hank is dazed and confused and he's getting up, he's like, hey, what are you, what are you knocking on my door for? I don't want that hundred dollars and hundred million dollar check for the rest of my life. <laughs> And then he was like, oh, here I am, and then he starts beating him up, and I like Hank's response, so I'm just going to write down here for a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think, yeah, well, on the one hand, Hank is a hired gun, but also we've only ever seen him, uh, he attacked Leo when Leo wasn't paying attention. Uh, we don't know if they, if they had been in a fair fight, we don't know who would have won. And then he threatened to kill Shelly in front of Leo. So, like, we haven't seen him do a whole lot of, like, really amazing stuff. Uh, if he had been, like, this awesome hand-to-hand fighter and then he got taken out easily by this guy who works with Josie, then I probably would be more willing to agree with you. Um, I, it didn't bother me too much. Yeah, and I, 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 I can see that. I, I can... I can probably, uh, I'll probably end up feeling that way in a couple, like, maybe episodes. Like, because you are right, it's not like he was, like, the boxing champion when he was in high school. But, uh, I like the way it ends where, like, he puts his thumb on, uh, Hank's thumb, and, like, like it's kind of like a mirror of that blood brother, blood relation thing that, uh, Hank did to Josie. He's mm-hmm. one, and it does imply that there's more to the character than just, we want it back in Hong Kong. Um, which is what he said. He's like, hey, we need you back in Hong Kong, Josie. Come on, come on. Like, oh, there's more to Josie. She's part of this organization, it seems like. But now it seems like this guy's got more of a beef and is, uh, you know, getting on Hank, too. So yeah. How Hank related to all this. It does, it is a good cliffhanger, and I do want to know where that goes. Well, and he does mention, well, and I should point out, uh, I don't know if you remember this or not. Uh, he was asking Josie, okay, is there going to be any problems? And she says, Hank might be a problem. And so he goes to attack Hank because he might be a problem in Josie getting out of town and fulfilling her mission here. Uh, so I think that's why he attacked Hank. Uh, and also, they do mention a character named Mr. Eckhart. Uh, we don't know anything about him, but he is somehow connected to Josie and this sinister Asian man. Uh, so that is a potential subplot for the future. And one last thing before I am out loud of things to say. It is so obvious, the identity of Fu Manchu, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to spoil it here, but it is so obvious from the beginning, the identity of Fu Manchu. Uh, yeah, I think um, if you just show me a picture of this person and then show me a picture of who they actually are, I would have a hard time saying, well, yeah, obviously. Because I think the disguise is pretty good, but I think the way they introduce Fu Manchu is very obvious. Because Fu Manchu is in this scene watching somebody. And it's somebody who this character has a beef with, a very good reason to have a beef with this character. So I think for that reason, it's very obvious in context. But out of context, if you just showed me a picture of this person in and out of disguise, I would say, no, that's a pretty good disguise. I can really recognize that person. Yeah. Um, I will say if, uh, if Hank answered the door and it was that uh, guy with a giant check and it's, you know, 10 million, he would say, well, now, what happens if I die tomorrow? How much is that money going to be worth then? <laughs> <laughs> they, they would be like, what is this guy talking about? Talking about the market value, he has the whole thing backwards. Yeah. Let's say I go to prison tomorrow, huh? Let's say, How much is that check really worth? Let's say I get that check, yeah. Um, yeah, that's about all I had to say, and I think you that's all you had to say? That is correct. All righty. Um, I guess we will be back next week with another episode. Uh, episode five? I think this was episode four of, of season two, right? 
I would agree with that. Yeah, okay, so then we'll be talking about episode five. Uh, and I think there's, what, 22 episodes in this season? Yeah, there is. Alrighty, so we'll, uh, we still got a lot of meat to dissect uh, in this season. A lot of plotty stuff to get through. Uh, so uh, that's all that we have. Uh, I am the uh, Comics Kid 2099. And I am Connor Nielsen. Alrighty. See you later. See you later.